For years, everyone in the materials science field has gathered in person at the spring and fall MRS annual meetings. We are all together again, but for the time being, virtually. Welcome to episode one of MRS TV. My name is Atria Godfrey, and I'm your source for everything you need to know about the 2020 virtual MRS spring and fall meeting. Stay tuned. Today is the exhibitor day at the 2020 MRS Spring and Fall Meeting. The exhibitor booths will be open for you to visit throughout the virtual meeting, but today we will have two two-hour segments where the exhibitors will be meeting with you personally in their booths. Stop by the exhibit hall between 9 and 11 a.m. or 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern for one-on-one -on -one discussions. Today also marks the beginning of live content. There will be live content every day now through Friday, December 4th. So let's start with a conversation we had with your 2020 MRS president. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. This meeting is certainly unlike any other in MRS history. Please tell us about your welcome message to attendees of this meeting. Well, thank you. I want to welcome everybody here to the first ever MRS virtual meeting. Uh, we really owe a lot to our meeting chairs. Uh, in particular, we own them every year, but in particular this year, they were faced with uh, a, a huge task because they organized the meeting and then they had to completely reorganize the meeting to make a successful virtual meeting. So I want to thank the spring meeting chairs, Ching Kao, Miyong Kim, Rajesh Naik, Jim Rodnelli, and Hong Wang. And I also want to thank the fall meeting chairs, Michael Flatte, Mike Rowe, Sabrina Sartori, uh, uh, Prasad Shastri, and Chung Min Wang. Now, I'm very excited looking at the program for this meeting, and I think you will be too. Now, one of the things that, that we tend to do is we, we get into very specifically narrow focus on our old field, and we don't look at the broader picture and we kind of lose the sense of wonder and enthusiasm that, that drew us to the science to begin with. And if you listen to some of the highlights, if you go to some of these award talks and plenary talks, you will be amazed at the sort of work that people are doing. Now, I also want to remind you, the meeting registration comes with a free MRS membership for one year. Um, that'll get you discounted uh, uh, fees to meetings, uh, free access to MRS journals uh, and internet content. And as long as you're a member, you might think about maybe there's some way you'd like to volunteer and get more involved with the MRS. We'd love to have you join. Uh, so thank you for joining us in this meeting. Tell us about the effort to move these meetings into the virtual space. What went into creating a virtual meeting? A lot of work went into that. Uh, and a lot of people worked on that. So this started, uh, once we decided to do it virtual, a number of things needed to happen to get going. So the headquarters needed to do extensive vetting of various providers to make sure we could get a secure and reliable meeting. Um, and they needed to understand um, what, what kind of uh, mix they could get of synchronous talks and asynchronous, meaning pre-recorded talks. And once that was, was sorted out, then uh, we, we could hand it over to the program, to, to the meeting chairs and the symposium organizers, because they had to rearrange their whole programs to adapt to this new type of meeting. Then finally, all of the presenters needed to record and upload their talks. So if that sounds like a lot of work, I, I think it really was. And I, I really want to thank all of you who were involved in all levels of making this possible. So thanks, guys. What are some of the highlights of your term as MRS president? And what are some of the challenges on the horizon for the 2021 president? One of the things I mentioned that we're doing governance reform this year, well, we're drawing up the plans for it, but she has to actually make it work next year. 
So that's going to be a challenge. Uh, I'm sure she's up to the challenge, but that has to happen. She, we're going to, as an organization, we're going to need to return um, from the virtual world, and, and we're, that's going to be a balancing act. And that's going to be a challenge to figure out exactly how to balance um, the demands of safety and the urgency to return from the virtual world. Uh, then finally, something that has been slowly percolating um, for a few years now uh, is we'd like to move in the direction of having our spring meeting differentiated from our fall meeting in terms of the meeting content. And, and that's, that's an ongoing challenge. It's one that I think that we can do as an organization. I think it will make for great meetings. So that's a sampling of things I think that need to be focused on next year. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great meeting, folks. Every day of the meeting, we are also going to be highlighting an organization or a university pushing material science research to new heights. Today, we start by going to Rutgers University, where the Department of Material Science is focusing more and more on modern materials and techniques, including plasmonic materials, biomaterials, and their computational study. Material Science and Engineering at Rutgers is about to celebrate its 120th year. We started originally as a ceramics department and we expanded into all materials. Some of the things that we're best known for are connections with the glass industry and the development of fiber optic engineering. We have many students now who have worked in the area of the Gorilla Glass that's on the iPhone. The newest members of our department represent the extensions of material science into newer fields, for example, nanotechnology, and especially in areas involving nanoparticles and plasmonics. Many of these topics have fit nicely with traditional topics. We've had a, a number of collaborations. We've incorporated nanoparticles into subject I research, which is sol gel processing. With plasmatic materials, we can make antennas, we can make filters, we can make solar cells or optoelectronic devices, or we can make sensors for biology and diagnostics. And the Fabris Lab works on integrating plasmonic nanoparticles to address health challenges and energy challenges, not only as they concern the developed countries, but also, and importantly, the developing world. My group has been working for many, many years looking at implementing these materials for the detection of diseases. To look at cancer, to look at how we can diagnose it, how we can stratify patients in specific categories for therapy. But what is important also are the new applications, such as recently our work on viruses. When a, a, a person is infected with a virus, at the beginning there is a small viral load, but still we need to detect them. And so our particles allow us to amplify the response that the virus gives us. And we hope that we'll be able to implement it to integrate the techniques that are currently used because our approach would be much lower cost, much lower complexity. And when we hope that that could be a reality soon. One of the projects is to take advantage of these nanoparticles uh, they are rare shape uh, nanoparticles called nanostars. It has very spiky structures. And we use these nanoparticles to enhance the uh, Raman scattering of a particular uh, fluorophore, sort of a Raman reporter. And we use this DNA nanostar conjugated structure to detect uh, specific RNAs uh, that, that is relevant for uh, identifying a specific virus is called influenza A virus. You know, this technology can be uh, applied to SARS-CoV-2, you know, the COVID-19, or a lot of different uh, viruses. And uh, the same thing that we can apply this technology for cancer cell detection. My group has been working with Dr. Fabrice's group towards the development of antiviral glasses. The aim is to design glass compositions which can actually degrade slowly and kill viruses. My approach has been to understand the molecular structure of glasses. How can we tailor the atomic structure of glass leading to how the glass will actually behave in the human body. We have a state-of-the-art glass synthesis lab where we can actually melt glasses at temperatures as high as 1700 degrees Celsius. 
My research group is called the Micromechanics, a deformation research group, and what we focus on is understanding what governs the mechanical behaviors of materials in terms of what's going on at the scale of individual defects and atomic structures. If we want to develop uh, new materials for implants, for example, as in some of the work Professor Gold's doing, we have to make sure that those materials are durable in the human body. In the case of two-dimensional materials, for example, uh, there's a potential to revolutionize semiconductors and move beyond the constraints that are imposed by conventional semiconductors. But to do that, we have to figure out how to manipulate the properties of those materials, for example, the band gap, in order to achieve that. In my lab, we work on studying electronic and optical interactions between nanostructures and semiconductors. We have sort of two focuses. One, it's on very fundamental research of the development of new types of nanostructured photonic devices, like nano lasers, nano antennas. Our other focus is on applied technologies, like improving the efficiency of light emitting devices used for display and lighting applications, and also for improving light harvesting in solar cells to boost their energy conversion efficiency. And we also have some applications in thin film lasers to improve their overall power conversion efficiency. So we've synthesized carbon dots in our lab using natural products. They're a type of new light emitting nanostructure and they have emission properties that depend on their solvent environment. The emission changes or is activated by applying a certain solvent uh, in contrast to water, which is the native medium in which the carbon dot is dispersed. That this has significant opportunities in thin film display applications used for cell phones, TV monitors, and general lighting applications. They also have applications in thin film solar cells that are being used to convert uh, sunlight to electricity for renewable energy. The material science department has had a storied history. I expect it to continue into the future, following up on some of the areas that they've been strong in in the past and expanding into new areas, working in areas related to biomedical materials as well as electronic materials and this new area of uh, modeling behavior using computational material science. Next, let's take an in-depth look at the work being done at the Northeaster Smart Center, where their vision is to merge smart technologies with humans' physical lives, with the ultimate goal of improving the quality of life for the world's population. We're at the verge of a new era of innovation in which the integration of advanced materials, structures, and devices into nanosystems is triggering transformations across a wide variety of industries. These are tiny devices and systems which we might not see with our eyes but are present everywhere in our lives. The Smart Center at Northeastern University envisions a world in which these smart technologies are merged with humans' physical lives with the ultimate goal of improving the quality of life. The Northeastern Smart Value Proposition is to help researchers, government and industry addressing the growing demand of sensing, communication and artificial intelligence at a cheap scale by reducing the time for innovation and transition of the new foundational nanosystem technologies that are going to be at the root of our nation's economic strength, national security and technological standing in the years to come. To implement our vision, we rely on an interdisciplinary, collaborative and strongly interactive environment which closely integrates efforts of researchers, government agencies, private foundations and industrial partners. The Northeastern Smart Interdisciplinary Team has collectively established a leading position in six key application areas. Zero-power wireless sensors and communication devices that are smart enough to turn on and perform their functionalities only when something relevant is happening eliminating the need for battery replacement and enabling the deployment of persistent and ubiquitous wireless monitoring systems in any environment and at a low cost. Radio frequency to terahertz devices and systems with unprecedented size, weight, and performance, solving the problem of spectrum scarcity and enabling high speed and low latency communication for driverless cars, virtual reality, and cloud computing. 
New generations of integrated quantum interfaces capable of connecting spatially separated nodes to permit secure communication channels and distributed quantum computing for a quantum internet capable of solving problems that are currently impossible to achieve in a single quantum computer. Radically new neuromorphic chips for next generation AI hardware and ultra high performance deep neural network model compression and hardware acceleration enabling real-time AI and mobile devices. Miniature actuators that can be used to deliver information by touch in virtual reality systems or enable finely controlled micro-scale soft robotic systems for medical applications. Networks of miniaturized biometric wireless sensor nodes that can be placed in the clothes, on the body, or under the skin of a person to provide real-time monitoring of physiological indicators and predict health outcomes. Beyond groundbreaking technological innovation, we focus on the development of manufacturing processes that are versatile and scalable towards production. We take advantage of unique nano-manufacturing facilities, and we offer design kits and multi-project wafer services to the broad innovation community to expand the engineering design base and dramatically reduce the time for innovation and transition of these new foundational technologies. The Smart Center, together with the Costas Research Institute at Northeastern University, are working with mission-driven agencies across defense, intelligence, and homeland security to bring forward new materials that provide superior capability at the sensor level and the secure communication level that then through partnership with industry and government partners can be brought into the platform level for new capabilities. For TDK InvenSense, it's important that we try to always develop technologies that are driving forward. And the reason I was interested in joining the Smart Center is because the relationships that we can build with the faculty and the students allow us to drive those technologies forward more quickly than we could do internally. So the impact of the center has been tremendous. It has created an environment in which the, the, the faculty and the industrial partners um, can come together um, and, and actually collaborate in an interdisciplinary environment for research, also for prototyping and technology translation in, in, in all of these areas. So the goal of the center is to have 20 to 40 percent of faculty and students being diverse, both in terms of gender and ethnicity. We are working with Northeastern's advanced office, which provides training to all of us in order to approach diversity with an open mind. One of the signatures of a Northeastern education is experiential learning. In the classroom, SMART combines traditional classroom experience with hands-on learning, case studies, and design groups. Outside the classroom, the Center combines Northeastern's signature cooperative education program with leading interdisciplinary research. With our distinctive model, we've been able to welcome and support students from around the world. Together, we've formed a diverse and inclusive community that prepares students from a wide variety of backgrounds to address the world's most urgent challenges. The biggest challenge of creating societal impact from innovative research is the ability to connect research to real-life solutions, and uh, this is both technical and business-wise. Northeastern Smart Center has created an environment that catalyzes impact by addressing both of those issues. First, they create a direct industry relationship with favorable IP agreements. Secondly, the center has bridged the void between lab and market by including development and pilot manufacturing in the center, which is another area that typically uh, leaves technology behind. The result is terrific momentum, uh, moving opportunities quickly to market. All of the work at the university, including the Smart Center, is geared in how do we do use-inspired, fundamental to applied research that can have real impact on problems and challenges for the world today. Through our collaboration with the Smart Center, we are able to actually bridge the gap between forward-looking theoretical principles and practice. Uh, and that's, that's really, I think, um, um, I think what the Smart Center for us is able to bring to, to, the, to the world. Embracing the true Northeastern University essence defined by innovation, entrepreneurial spirit, experiential learning, global engagement and diversity, Northeastern Smart is very well positioned to lead the change in this exciting new era of technological innovation.
Well, that is it for us today, but make sure to stay tuned for more exclusive content each day of the meeting. And don't forget to browse the People tab to connect with speakers and your fellow attendees. And make sure you join us tomorrow as we preview Saturday's tutorial and technical sessions. We'll see you tomorrow.